This is an oral history interview with Dr. Richard Burkhart, Vice President Emeritus of Academic Affairs uh, and Provost Emeritus at Ball State University. It is being conducted uh, on December 16, 1996 as part of the Ball State University Oral History Project. The interview is taking place in Bracken Library, Room 205, the office of Dr. Anthony O. Edmonds, Professor of History. Uh, Dr. Edmonds is the interviewer. Uh, Dr. Burkhart, first of all, I want to thank you very much for taking your valuable time to talk to me and to talk to the camera uh, mm -hmm. about your experiences at Ball State. Uh, I sent you a list of general questions that we might be talking about. Obviously, that's not written in stone. If other things come to your mind or my mind, I think we should feel perfectly free to talk about them. I would also point out that th three of Dr. Burkhart's uh, written recollections of his time at Ball State are in the Ball State University archives, uh, and that these will be available for those who see this tape and want uh, uh, and want to have some kind of uh, uh, elaboration on what Dr. Burkhart says today. Uh, the publications are. The Teachers College Becomes a University uh, in the North Central Association uh, Quarterly uh, for uh, the winter of 1967, a an unpublished manuscript uh, called Remembering Ball State, uh, which Dr. Burkhart very kindly uh, presented to a class that I taught on the history of Ball State. And finally, uh, an essay in a publication by Ball State University called Ball State University 1918 to 1993, uh, a, a, an article entitled Ball State from Teachers College to University. Some of what he says today in the interview will be a uh, recapitulation of what he says in these uh, written works. Uh, those of you who wish to read more about what Dr. Burkhart says, uh, the archives has uh, these articles. Well, after my spending about five minutes taking up your time, uh, let's start the interview, Rich. Uh, one of the things you don't really talk about in your written work about Ball State is something about your background before you even came here, and I think mm -hmm. I'd be interested in knowing uh, something about Rich Burkhart prior to Ball State. Well, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in this series of oral history reviews. It's uh, really fun. I'm happy to do so. I, I grew up in uh, Newton, Massachusetts, and attended schools uh, at Newton, Massachusetts, graduated from Newton High, and went to Galesburg, Illinois, Knox College, uh, where uh, I got my bachelor's degree. I was 39. I majored in history and English, and uh, received a Phi Beta Kappa key. Went on to Harvard uh, University for my graduate work and got a degree in history in 1940, a degree called <clears throat> Master of Arts in Teaching, which was kind of a combination of history and some work in education in 42. And in 1950, my dissertation was finally accepted, <laughs> and I have an Doctor in Education from Harvard in Social Studies Education. I went to Lenox School for Boys, which is in upstate Massachusetts, uh, for a half year. It was my first teaching experience. And from there to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where for three years I was a teacher in Tulsa Central High School. Came back to Harvard. Uh, to work on my doctorate and then went to Syracuse as a faculty member and there I had the unique title of dual professor of history and education which meant that my office was in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and I taught history and part of the time and the other part of the time I was uh, supervising social studies student teachers, and also teaching the methods courses. I wish I had known that a few years ago when we were having trouble finding someone to teach methods in <laughs> the <laughs> 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 Well, 
<laughs> well, um, nobody asked. <laughs> when, uh, when was it that you started at Syracuse? 54, uh, 1945 to 52. 1945 okay. to 52. And before I left, uh, I was the director of the undergraduate program in teacher education. So we came here to Ball State in 52. Uh, I know some of the other people I've interviewed, uh, Vic Lawhead, for example, indicated that uh, John Emlin sort of found them uh, mm -hmm. based on something Vic had written, John Emmons learned of his work, and then went after him. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you have any sense when the Ball State job came open of being sought out by Mr. Emmons, or did it work out a little differently for you? Well, I, you should never underestimate Emmons, and maybe he knew more than I thought he did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but my introduction to Ball State was from Wendell Grunewald, who went to Syracuse to earn a doctorate in social sciences. And then when he was doing that, I, I got to know him and we worked together on a number of things. So when he knew that Ralph Neuer was retiring, he urged me to apply for the job. Now was he at, was uh, Wendell at Ball State by this time? Yes, yes, and he was on leave from Ball State uh, to go to Syracuse to work on that doctorate. When he came back, uh, he found that Neuer would retire and he he invited me to apply, so I did. I don't know if among the letters that you've looked at, you've seen Emmons reply to me, and he said, thank you very much for your letter. We're really looking for a PhD, but we'll keep your letter on file. No, I have not seen that letter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had met Neuer at a meeting one summer up at University of Wisconsin and enjoyed talking to him, but at that time, uh, I just thought he was a very interesting person and uh, made no connection. Later on, uh, there was a fellow named Smith Smock, Charlie Smock, uh, who graduated from Ball State, went to Syracuse uh, as a graduate student, got his degree there, and then he went over to Purdue for many years. Uh, he was in psychology over there and a lady named Wilsey, Clara Wilsey, came to Syracuse one summer. So you, you knew of Ball State partly through connections of Ball right. State graduates you had worked with and right. your meeting with Mr. Norio. Did you have any sort of picture formed in your mind of Ball State before you uh, actually came here for your interview? Did it have a reputation one way or another? In the oh, yes, yes, it, it did have a reputation, a uh, fine reputation, actually. Uh, there was one little volume called A Hundred Years of Teacher Education, something like that, and Ball State was listed as one of the outstanding uh, teacher education institutions. Ypsilanti is usually mentioned as one of the first ones, uh, but I was pleased to uh, have it so highly recommended, and then when I talked to people like Charlie Smock, uh, they echoed what Roy Grunwald had said, and so I began to look in various sources to see what more I could find, and <clears throat> it was all it was all positive. And then when uh, Dorothy and I were invited out for an interview, well, of course we ran into Hoosier Hospitality, and uh, found that it was at at least as nice as people have said it was. Do you have any uh, idea of why Mr. Emmons changed his mind from that initial letter when he, he, it sounds like he was saying an EDD is not quite what we're looking for. Was he implying, do you think, that it wasn't good enough? I mean, he had one. Well, <clears throat> I think his goal was to take Ball State Teachers College from a teacher's college to a college. Uh, and in doing that, uh, it was necessary to strengthen what one would call the subject matter areas. Right. And over the years, it attracted a fine faculty in education. Uh, but some of the people who came in English or math uh, or uh, other subjects uh, were 
a little reluctant to be quite as enthusiastic as the mm -hmm. professors of education were. So he thought it would be a symbol uh, to see how many PhDs he could recruit. Uh, I only, m my career met one other person who had been interviewed. He was older uh, than I was, but perfectly well qualified. And I think maybe the thing that made him change his mind was the Harvard degree. Because mm -hmm. if he couldn't have a PhD, at least he had a Harvard <laughs> degree. See, he was, he was always boosting. Now here I'm digressing a little bit. That's he was, okay. That's he right. was always boosting uh, the institution. Uh, and so, for example, uh, he insisted, but he didn't have to work very hard, uh, that I write up the questionnaire to get my name in who's who. Uh, and he picked out a couple of other people to do that. And he, he was always encouraging faculty to step out and be recognized in their professional organizations and one thing or another like that. Because he kept telling the world that Ball State was the most wonderful college in the world. And um, he felt that as soon as people met faculty members uh, and other representatives of the institution, they would agree with him. Uh, you say you and Dorothy were invited, your wife. Mm -hmm. uh, was this uh, fairly, uh, in, the invitation was given to both of you then, it wasn't? Uh, oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit unusual, I think, in contemporary times where if the spouse comes along for a job interview, it's uh, more or less on the, the family's uh, request rather than the invitation. Mm, no, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be right. Uh, I wasn't part of the interview for Worthen, but uh, I was for Anderson and uh, not for not for Proust either. Uh, but but uh, for, uh, for high-level administrators, yeah, I think uh, yeah, the, the spousal they, thing they, is, they, is fairly common still. Uh, when, why do you think you took the job as you look back 42 years ago? Well, I'd done a, a lot of things that I wanted to do uh, in, in Syracuse. Uh, in a sense, I'd been pushed upstairs uh, to become the director of the Teacher Education Project. Uh, I was uh, at a stage, <clears throat> I think I was 34. Uh, when if I was going to move, I, I needed to move because the youngsters hadn't established any close affiliations with school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be difficult to break. And I had met and worked with a couple of deans uh, at Syracuse who fit the stereotype of devious deans. And I thought it would be an interesting challenge to see if you could be a dean without being devious. <laughs> <laughs> this leads to a whole range of questions I hadn't thought to ask, but, but we will we will get uh, we will get to them. Uh, yeah, and other people, uh, administrators I've interviewed, there seems to be a fairly common feeling, as as one person put it, that gee, I thought that maybe I could do it a little differently or a mm -hmm. little better, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of test of uh, of of what you perceive to be your strengths. Right. Uh, so, you, you decided to come to Ball State. Uh, when you arrived, take me back to that first year and talk a little bit about your impressions, what the, the pluses were, were there any problems you ran into that were unexpected, any adjustment difficulties? Well, I came in the summer uh, and <clears throat> Must have been August. I looked that up sometime, and and Ralph Neuer sat with me every day, and went down the list of faculty, and told me who they were and what their outstanding characteristics were, good and bad, from his point of view. There were 192 maybe at that time. Uh, so I had some clues when I got to meet people about who they were and what they were doing. And that was a great help. And after that, uh, he walked away and he never came back. 
Uh, he never looked over my shoulder or in any way indicated that what <laughs> he thought what I was doing was good, bad, or awful, or whatever. Well, he was available if you He was available if uh, I wanted him. And one time I, I invited him down to our church to talk to what was called the Layman's League at that time, and he was happy to do that. He went over to Anderson College and taught several years over there. Uh, he was a great person. And I think I said in my essay that m many members of the faculty said that <coughs> they should, somebody should make a book of Neuerisms because he had such an apt way of saying things that it'd keep a person in stitches. Well, you know, nobody did. Uh, <laughs> it was just one of those things they should have done. There, there's a lot, that, partly in your files and partly in his, there's a lot of his correspondence mm -hmm. around. So I think, fortunately, I will be able to at least mm -hmm. uh, get some Neuerisms in. But you, you missed the best part of it, because he wrote a lot of stuff in shorthand, and an ancient former shorthand, Pittman, I think it was called, and, and nobody he, only he could understand. Only he could read it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found it. Well, actually, I did find uh, one little note in the archives in shorthand mm -hmm. that, that made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. I, mm -hmm. I assume it's nothing terribly private that, uh, <laughs> and personal. You, you say he talked to you about the 190 faculty mm -hmm. uh, or so. Were these faculty who were on tenure uh, or, or pre-tenure or temporary? What were the kind of categories that, that, that faculty would, would uh, The be? distinction wasn't that great. Uh, we just went down the line, department by department, and uh, it helped me to learn their names and their interests, and uh, it, it was just very thoughtful of them to do that. And then, um, I guess I was struck by the quality of the people that I met. The uh, chair of the Faculty Advisory Council, who had some influence someplace along the line, was Angie Wilson, who was a social studies teacher over at Burris. And she was a little peppery, wonderful lady uh, who was just as sharp as a tack and had everybody on their toes all the time. And um, uh, at Syracuse, I don't remember too many women. Um, there were two outstanding ones, but uh, not very many women in, in leadership roles. And Burris was very definitely a part of the college. Uh, otherwise, a Burris faculty person would not have had that role. Um, you know, first-rate people, uh, Graham Poe, who followed her in that in that chair, uh, uh, was a, a real careful thinker and a hard-working man. His assignment was supervision of student teaching. Um, I just found most everybody was uh, really willing to be helpful, and. Um, As I, again, referring to the essay, said there were at least two people that I can remember vividly who uh, tried to help me in a very positive and a direct way. Uh, Delbert Henry Jeep was one. And he took me off with him to supervise student teaching. And on the way to Elkhart or wherever it was we went, and all the way back, <clears throat> he explained to me what my assignment was and what I was supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> the other uh, blessed name was Curtis Howd. Uh, who was Principal Burris. Told me, you'll never be any better dean than we, the faculty, will permit you to be. Uh, and uh, of course there's a lot of truth in that because uh, an institution is made up of all of its people and the faculty are, are really significant. So. Uh, that didn't hurt, and it was probably a good idea for me to have those concepts reinforced. What, uh, what 
did you see or what did Jack Emmons suggest to you or what did you work out would be your central role as, as dean of the college? What were some of the, the major responsibilities that you had when you stepped into that job? Well, if you talk to some of the other people uh, who had dean's roles, you'll find that when they asked him that question, he said, well, you just would do what a dean does. Uh, which was in a way frustrating and in another way liberating uh, because uh, you were supposed to work your, your way out. Uh, so the first clue I had was I followed what Neuer did and that was almost everything. Uh, I think the first, I can't remember whether I wrote about this or not, but the state of Indiana provided what they call the state scholarships, uh, two from each county. It was later expanded to six. And these were awarded on the basis of statewide examination. It, the administration of that examination floated around between IU, Purdue, Ball State, and Indiana State at Terre Haute. And the uh, first two years I was here, my secretary, Mary Alice Lanning, and I uh, wrapped the examinations, sharpened the pencils, uh, sent them off to 92 counties uh, and uh, however many high schools there were at that time and there were a lot more because consolidation hadn't really run its full course yet. Uh, we did it for two years. Later uh, that assignment was moved to student affairs and scholarship became something else. Uh, that the dean of the college didn't have to mess with. But I'm sure working with faculty uh, was seen, as, and the curriculum was seen as my primary assignment. And back in those days, as I've said elsewhere, it's a little hard to believe, but the, the dean's role was really that of supervisor. So, for example, uh, I was supposed to go around and, and visit the classes of all new instructors. Uh, it had been reduced from all faculty to just new faculty. And Neuer had done that. Uh, he carried a clipboard and he sat in the back row and he wrote in Pittman shirt hand. And <clears throat> when the faculty saw him coming in, <laughs> they were purely petrified. Uh, after the visitation, uh, the dean's job was to sit down with that faculty member and discuss what happened uh, with the notion that that might be of some help. I did that for a while, uh, but uh, it got impossible when there were so many new faculty coming in. But I uh, find some notes uh, that the president had told me, this is exam week. Now what you better do is walk the halls uh, and see that people are really giving exams as they're supposed to. Now you look at it today, uh, professors, especially full professors, do whatever they please, whenever they please, however they please, and the intrusion of the provost just, just would never happen. As a supervisor, was part of your job then what the provost does now, and that is make judgments and decisions about uh, items like promotion and tenure. Uh, was that part of your original uh, Oh yes, job? yes, yes. Uh, the, the department head made a recommendation to me and I in turn to the president uh, and no promotion was made uh, without that route being followed. Uh, in the beginning it was fairly automatic uh, after a certain period of time, if you had your degree earned. That five, is, ten tenure was automatic. Yeah, five years, seven years, uh, you were on your way up. Now that changed uh, so that today uh, people are or are not promoted based on the recommendations of their departmental committee and their department chair and their college dean and and the provost uh, before it goes to the president and the board. So <clears throat> any place along the line, questions can be raised uh, and um, people turn down for one reason or another. But you, you did not 
in your early experience, say during the during the Emmons period, uh, you did not run into many cases in which you had to say to someone or, or the chair said and you agreed that this person no. shouldn't have tenure. The the primary thing was 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 having the requisite uh, the requisite d degree do degrees you, and yeah. it and do experience. You do you recall when uh, the PhD or the terminal degree in each uh, discipline became uh, virtually a requirement for tenure? Oh, it was when I came. Yeah. It was already it was, in, it was in already place. in place. Yes, right, right. So there are a number of people who are not. Full professors, uh, and one of the Emmons always had to be <clears throat> making some kind of studies or surveys, uh, uh, and one of the studies we continually made was uh, to see where people got their advanced degrees and uh, which institutions that they came from and how many PhDs we had, and how many all-butters, and how many MAs, and so on. Um, I always tried to insist on having an MA before anybody was engaged. And then uh, always did what was possible to smooth the way so a person could leave for a year and do his graduate study and then come back. So we grew our own PhDs um, mm -hmm. that way. Jerry Nisbet and Tom Mertens are good examples of people who went over to Purdue and then came back, and we were just so pleased that they had done that. Um, and we were always trying to find more and more people with advanced degrees because that was supposed to be the mark of a quality institution. Did uh, President Emmons become actively involved in the process in the sense that he would look fairly carefully at the files and the recommendations. Uh, many presidents today, I think, it fairly pro forma. If the you know, department and the committees and the college and the provost, et cetera, if it's gotten that far, I, mm -hmm. I can't think of a case at Ball State, at least, that uh, in the last 15 years, which a president has basically said, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Well, you haven't talked to a lot of people about Emmons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is post. This is post Emmons. <laughs> uh, uh, no, Jack Emmons engaged everybody who who was engaged, uh, and he kept a folder, and he wrote notes in that folder. And faculty came in for an annual interview, especially when they were new, and he got out the folder and they looked to see what he'd written the year before, and and added new notes on the basis of that. No, I. Actually, the way, particularly when there were so many faculty members that needed to be engaged, uh, as uh, this wave of enrollment came through, we would go to Chicago uh, to the AACTE meetings or the North Central Association meetings, and it was sometimes uh, referred to as a slave market. For if you were a professor at uh, Michigan and you had a a couple of people that you thought uh, needed jobs, why you'd go down and you'd find out where Ammon's room was and, and uh, send the young people up there. And so a lot of those meetings we sat together in, <clears throat> in a hotel room and interviewed people. And after the president had decided uh, who was quality, then they were invited to the campus and the department had an opportunity to see if they agreed. But uh, no, the, you're talking about the Emmons years. Uh, uh, President Emmons made the decisions. And um, later, he decided that it was about time that I did that. And so I got to make uh, the decisions. But that didn't last too long because uh, by then the college deans felt that that was a responsibility that they should assume. So. Emmons was really getting the place ready for being a university. I almost forgot when you were talking about promotions. You see, it was pro forma, and it was automatic. And I rebelled a little bit uh, when he said, now, we need a write-up.
to go with each one of these people who's coming forward. I mean, why should he be promoted? And I said, well, you're going to promote him because it's automatic. No, he said, that's not right. He said, we really should promote people who have uh, the characteristics that go with being promoted. So you write something on everybody you want to be promoted. And, you know, once you get in the habit of doing that, uh, the, the structure is set up, and pretty soon it can be organized so it really means something. And in retrospect, uh, he did that in a number of ways, getting ready for what was going to come next. Uh, he's a great guy. One of the fairly constant themes that I have seen about Ball State in the 1950s and, and early 60s uh, from other people I've interviewed is the notion, the, 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 the image, the metaphor of family, uh, local community. Uh, Bob Linson even suggested it was almost like a cocoon in, in his view in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, as dean of the college, did you sense this sort of family community quality to the university. Oh yes, it's very, very definite, very definite. Uh, it goes way back uh, when the balls used to have picnics for the faculty in McCullough Park. Uh, Do you remember when that started, by the way? No. Do you remember when they stopped doing no, it? No, they were not doing it in 52. Yeah. Not doing it in 52. but. When we had all-day faculty meetings, uh, that was a device to bring people together, and we went from everybody having breakfast together to lunch together. Uh, then I guess uh, somebody decided it was too expensive, so we didn't do that anymore. Uh, but the faculty meetings used to be held in Recital Hall, and they were always preceded by tea in the arts side, and the lounge there. Um, tea and cookies, and everybody everybody came. Uh, if a person felt that he or she was not going to be able to come to the faculty meeting, uh, had to get permission from the dean of the college to be absent. <laughs> you can't imagine that even existing uh, today, but. Uh, There were some things that the departments did together, like departmental picnics, for instance. Uh, science people always went down to Hagerstown. Uh, and uh, I guess they still do. Well, they still do, because of course I missed the Christmas party in the history department uh, just this last week. But family, it was uh, clear that Emmons was the father figure, and if you really got in trouble or needed something done, why uh, you'd go to him and he fixed it. Uh, and we did what we could to try to maintain that as long as possible. Uh, one of the things that we recognized was that new faculty coming from California or Texas or someplace like that didn't have a clue about what it was like to be in Muncie, Indiana at Ball State. And so started a series of orientations for new faculty, introducing them first to the business office, how do they get their checks, and <laughs> <laughs> student affairs in the library. And, yeah, and I, I always enjoyed telling them about uh, what a family place this was and what we expected of them. Uh, they were supposed to be good neighbors uh, to the people they lived next to, wherever it was they lived, uh, because uh, they had to appreciate the fact that wherever they went, they were identified as Ball State faculty members. And if they got in trouble, that would be not good for the, for the college itself. Mm. Many people just never really thought about it that way. And uh, I'm not sure that I uh, did until I'd heard Emmons say it several times. And uh, it seemed like a worthwhile concept to hang on to. And if uh, people were irked at the, at the supervision that we did, 
uh, like making sure that they gave their examinations on time and all that, uh, we always said, well, you know, if you don't follow the rules, uh, you're really tearing down the institution. And, and if you don't like the institution, you really ought to go someplace else. Uh, so, yeah, it was a, a community uh, as long as possible. And we tried to string that out even beyond that. We had faculty square dances up in the Practical Arts Building. Uh, it used to be a, a dem what they call a demonstration room up there with a little stage on one end and a kitchen on the other and all open in between. And faculty wives carried in food and Bob McCall and some other people uh, called the dances. And we played the music was played on a record. Uh, but um, there are a lot of ways in which in the bowling league, uh, Monday night, Emmons was an avid bowler. And uh, there were teams, uh, the whole bowling area was filled up regularly on Monday nights. It was a great opportunity to meet other people. Uh, people knew one another. A lot of ways. That actually leads to a related question. Uh, I've gotten a strong sense in the, the archival and interview work I've done with, with Dr. Emmons. Uh, that he really believed in a community of relative equals in, in mm, terms okay. of, of importance to the university, prestige. In other words, that, to put it another way, the, the, the faculty was not necessarily at the top and the custodians at the bottom mm -hmm. in terms of, of the way he perceived people should be treated. And uh, Bowling League bought it up because I remember when I was in Bowling League, Initially, there were uh, about 18, all 18 lanes were filled. The last time I bowled, I think we had four teams total, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which to me is a kind of symbol of, of you know, various things that happens when a university gets big. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it a fair assessment to say that Dr. Emmons' view of, of the university was more a continuum than a hierarchy? Yes, it's, it's fair to say that. And you might fault him, as some people would, uh, by saying everybody was equal except Emmons. <laughs> <coughs> he was the only one who parked by the ad building. But then that was a college car, and uh, some people didn't really like that. But he went out of his way. Uh, it didn't make any difference if a person was a custodian, had a new baby, or got married, or something like that. He always dashed off a note, went around to see him. Um, student affairs people were not relegated to a secondary position. Uh, that irritated a number of faculty, but uh, right, right, that's a, that's a fair assessment. When the, uh, when the institution began making moves toward becoming a university, and I know you said in, in your writing that, that it, was, it was a university in fact before it mm -hmm. became a university in name, uh, one of the things that the president did was create four vice presidential areas. Uh, refresh mm -hmm. my memory, what year was that again? Was that 60? No, I was going to write that down, and I didn't. Well, I, I'm sure I've got it yeah, in my file yeah. somewhere, mm -hmm. but it was, it was prior to 1965. Mm -hmm. It was prior to the, the actual legislative decision to make oh, yes. the university. Yes. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you ever feel that the academic affairs area was slighted in any way because of the equality in, in the student affairs, business affairs, public affairs? No, it wasn't elevated. It really was uh, on an equal, equal plane. And uh, I guess by then, uh, 10 years, uh, and working closely with people who were heads of those areas, uh, even though they didn't have the title vice president, um, I wasn't sensitive enough to feel slighted about that. So you want, it didn't concern you, for example, that uh, oh, the admissions office was in the student affairs area rather than academic affairs? Because I, I have interviewed some people who got their feathers ruffled because of, of that, or that orientation, for example. 
was a student affairs rather than an academic affairs operation. Well, it didn't seem that way. Now, there was, uh, or maybe there still is, a kind of a tension between student affairs and academic affairs uh, and that comes out in Carmichael as well as some other places. Um, but when, it, when Emmons made a decision, like organization, he really did a lot of research. And a man named Russell from the United States Office of Education was just interested in that at that time. I think his name was John, too, uh, but Russell in any event. And he made some kind of a study and came up with the conclusion that there were four functions in a university. Uh, and that they needed to be represented by individual heads. And he separated out the several functions that belonged, uh, in, say, in academic areas or in student affairs areas. Uh, and it was that model which he had a chance to uh, look at at all the other colleges and universities because he was always traveling around looking at other colleges and universities. Um, it persuaded him that this is the way we should go. Now, personally, I was delighted when the scholarship thing was taken over by student <laughs> affairs. And I don't know that uh, I was ever directly responsible for admissions. Maybe by the time Dick Richardson came, which was just before I came, uh, that had already been uh, assigned to student affairs. Uh, so, yeah. I didn't really have time to feel that slight that some people told me about, and uh, uh, academic affairs uh, perhaps seemed not to get as much on the surface because you could build residence halls with non-state money, and you could only build classroom buildings with state money. And there were more residence halls going up than there were classroom buildings. Mm -hmm. and so if you wanted to, you could feel that academic weren't quite as, uh, as uh, important as student affairs. And then, you know, Emmons was everywhere. Uh, and he particularly enjoyed uh, being associated with student affairs, not like homecoming, riding in the Mm -hmm. uh, and the convertible with the Queen and the bonfire and uh, he was very visible and vocal at every basketball game and uh, he just loved students and so some faculty might have felt that the scales were tipped uh, the wrong way but I I didn't have that sense and you felt that that it was a more comfortable model for you to work with than, than say, provost on top and, and vice presidents reporting to him and competing with each other for his favors? Uh, that thought never occurred to me <laughs> until John Bruce was president. And we had a bunch of what were called uh, Rockefeller fellows in studying administration. And they were female and black, I mean one or the other, uh, and we had about six of them, I guess. It was part of AACMU. This would have been in the mid-70s. 70s, yeah. And um, they came into my office for a weekly seminar or something like that, and we sat around and talked about one thing and another and, and brought different people in, and Bruce came in. Uh, and one of the black women asked him why he didn't have a provost. And he looked at me as though he thought I had primed him to ask that question. <laughs> uh, well, maybe I was super sensitive then because I had not primed him, them to ask that question. And I don't think I ever really thought of myself that way because I was accustomed to Emmons. Uh, not being an external person who was a fundraiser or something like that. He was in charge of everything. And uh, Bruce coming along following him did the same thing. He wasn't ready to let go. Uh, Anderson was, uh, at least he said he was, by creating the office of provost. 
but uh, no, that I never thought of myself as provost. You uh, talked about Emmons really enjoying the students and oh, yeah. enjoying knowing the students and meeting the students. I know from my research that uh, from the time he came, uh, he would uh, have exit interviews with uh, with all seniors. the seniors. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, as far as you know, that that continued up till uh, till he retired. I'm sure it did. Yeah, uh, I, I do recall the in the early '60s or the thing in the Daily News where he said that he would be more than happy to see roommates together mm -hmm. if it would be more convenient for them. <laughs> and I got the impression that as the number of seniors went up, he was spending more and more time. That's right. Uh, that's a good good measure of that. The other thing that uh, uh, measures is he used to send people. Uh, Nell used to call people and say, you haven't been in for your senior interview. Uh, but that kind of backed off and uh, he made announcements that you were welcome to come and we wanted you to come, but uh, nobody really enforced it. Look, can we stop this? No. Okay. okay, we're rolling. Uh, before my phone rang, I forgot to take off the hook. You were talking about Dr. Emmons and students. and. And we were talking some about the, the senior interviews, and then you were making another point, and it kind of got uh, drowned out by the phone. Well, as it became impossible, he no longer insisted that uh, seniors come in. And so his secretary gave up the practice of calling them and saying, hey, you haven't come in yet. Uh, they just said, we want you to come, and you come if you want to. And some students did that. Uh, a related issue uh, in looking at where people came from who came to the mm -hmm. faculty, that mm -hmm. is where their homes were, where their degrees were, uh, in the 50s and even into the 60s, late, from, from about the late 40s into the, the 60s, looking at the back of the catalog, uh, a substantial percentage of faculty and staff had Ball State degrees of one kind or another. Uh, and or Midwestern degrees. Mm -hmm. Did you get the impression that as a uh, Yankee you were somewhat of an aberration around Ball State? Did, uh, did Dr. Emmons tend to prefer, you think, maybe Midwesterners for faculty and staff? Or people with Midwest? Of course, you went to, to Knox College. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you see that uh, did away with uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> that destroyed all of the evil influence of <laughs> right. Boston and Right, New certainly, certainly did. Well, uh, there's no question but what we, uh, I mean, I was impressed with this too, sought Midwestern faculty. And uh, after a while, we really tried not to employ anybody from IU because at one point we had 21 people from IU. Uh, but Iowa, Michigan, Ohio State, uh, you're getting out there. And that was partly related to our view of who the students were. And if you had somebody who hadn't grown up uh, with the kind of young people who came to Ball State, they uh, might be impatient. The only thing wrong was the kids that came to Ball State was that they hadn't read very much. Uh, and that's what they came to get fixed. Uh, so we thought it was helpful if professors were understanding of that and willing to go a little more than halfway in, in order to meet the kids where they were. Uh, now, if you'd grown up in Texas or Florida or California or someplace like that, you had maybe different expectations of uh, what the students were. They all, you know, they still do, I guess, uh, tend to be, well, no, that can't be quite right. But they used to be first-generation mm -hmm. students. Uh, their parents didn't have the Atlantic Monthly on the table at home. Uh, they had done well in high school, but uh, that was before advanced placement uh, and things like that. So I think we were looking for faculty members who uh, had some appreciation of uh, how far 
these kids had come already and how much farther they could go with a little encouragement. And um, it wasn't anti-Harvard and Yale, uh, but uh, a sense that if, you, if you'd been through it yourself, you had some notion of what the kids were going through. Was there also a tendency to hire people who had had high school oh, yes. teaching experience? Oh, yes, sure. Be sure. Being a teacher's college. Being a teacher. Uh, see, that just emphasizes the business about appreciating students. Uh, you had some notion of what students were like, and they weren't that different by the time they came in as freshmen than they were in seniors in high school. Um, because the war created the GI Bill of Rights and a lot of people came up uh, that way, we finally decided that experience in the military, and particularly if it was teaching in the military, uh, would be helpful too. And then more and more other experiences uh, kind of took over and, and the people no longer required that uh, high school experience or elementary school experience. Uh, as we move into the 1960s, uh, clearly Ball State changes mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of ways. If you had to, say, take the year you came, 52, 53, as one date, and then let's take 1965, the mm -hmm. year Ball State became a university, what, what would you see as some of the major, the major changes that had taken place in that, that decade and a third? How much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> there are a ton. There are really a ton. And of course, uh, it's driven by the explosion in student enrollment, which people didn't really anticipate. I fell in, over to Ohio State University. Uh, the name escapes me at the moment. Wrote a book called uh, "Title Oncoming Tidal Wave of Student Enrollment," and that meant that we grew exponentially uh, over the years. Well, that meant everything else had to grow. Uh, we had to have more faculty. We had to have more buildings. The institution bought more land. Uh, whatever you can think of, uh, just got more and bigger. So that growth. Uh, might very well be uh, one of the changes that uh, important. And presumably not all of those students wanted to be teachers, but they wanted to go to college. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and from really the very beginning, there was always an option for people who didn't want to be teachers or who were thought not to be good teacher material. Uh, and that was an interesting period, too, when people were turned down and were because uh, Dr. Wood said they were overweight. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, she was supported in this by Paul Royalty, who said anybody who was that fat had no sense of discipline. Uh, well, well, this, I'm, this was in the 50s? 50s, yeah. yeah. But I digress. The, the main thing that isn't really all that visible uh, when you talk about growth is the curriculum changes. And uh, while the major curriculum was teaching, there was a non-teaching option. Now, it took somebody bright like Victor Lawhead to recognize that that was a, not a very good thing to do. <laughs> and um, so I really gave him all kinds of uh, recognition and praise there because he went through a number of very stormy years in, in trying to talk to faculty about curriculum when all they wanted to do was talk about their course. But the first thing was to recognize that there was professional curricula and there were academic curricula that were not related to teaching and then there were teaching. And the minute that we did that, that was a fundamental change to recognize that difference. You would see this as occurring late 50s, early 60s. Early early sixties, I would say. You know, Victor would be better. Uh, well, we, we it's written down someplace. It wouldn't be too hard to find. Right. The other thing that he did that was so great was that 
when the lid was off and you didn't have to be offering teaching programs, many departments wanted to take over the entire curriculum. Uh, the College of Business was one. They felt that people who graduated really need to be drilled. They need to do shorthand typing, accounting, and all that stuff. Fortunately, uh, we were assisted by the National Association of Schools of Business, whatever they called it, uh, because at the national level, they began to understand that people didn't want train folk to come into their businesses. They wanted educated people. And so they set a curriculum standard for all colleges of business, uh, which denied the over-eager professors of business uh, more than their share of the curriculum. They had to have liberal arts courses. Uh, so Vic spent a lot of time debating with people what's the proper balance between specialization and general education. Uh, what is a major and what is a minor? And I think uh, it worked really very well with one cardinal exception, and that would be music. The music people wanted the whole 192 hours, uh, and they put those kids through rehearsals and quartets and uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, eventually they backed off a little bit, and then I guess art followed uh, that, because they had a different view. Uh, Hargraves was thinking a conservatory, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, the art people, now this is much later, uh, were thinking professional art. Uh, before it was clear See, before all this, it was clear what a major was because the Teacher Training and Licensing Commission said what a major. in Indianapolis said what a major was. Now you've got some people who are not going to be teachers, so why shouldn't they have 100% of their courses in history? Uh, history people were more reasonable, maybe because they already had a large share of general education <laughs> and could afford to be magnanimous. <laughs> so that's... Uh, a whole story in itself, and I hope that Victor told you a lot of that, yes. although he may have been modest uh, in, in the way he did it, but uh, without his leadership, it just wouldn't have happened. And similarly, but he didn't have the same battles because uh, he didn't listen, uh, Kanker developed a master's program, and at first it was always a master of arts in education. Then we got a master of arts, and that had zero education in it because the teacher had already satisfied the licensing requirements and the only thing that was now required in the new licensing was a fifth year. Nobody said what was in that fifth year. And uh, that was a change. And of course, it's during this period that we went from two cooperative doctorate programs, one with IU and Purdue, to 19, I guess we have now, 19 doctorates that are offered by Ball State directly. So, you know, those have got to be fundamental changes uh, that uh, came about that affected the whole institution. I know one change that is often mentioned is... Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Burkhart, we were talking about uh, changes in... Uh, in Ball State between the 50s and the 60s, and, and other people I've talked to have suggested that symbolically a major change uh, involved the College of Architecture. Uh, mm -hmm. That when that became a part of Ball State, that in a way symbolized and even generated some of the, 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 the changes as we move from a teacher's college to a university. Uh, would you be able to talk a little bit about the, the genesis of the architecture college? Who, who thought of it? Why did Ball State get it and not, uh, and not one of the other schools? And, and how did the architecture college help change the university or change the institution? Well, I enjoy talking about that and, and did, of course, in the essay. And so now I will repeat some of the things we said before. Uh, I don't know how far back you want to go, <laughs> but the architects observed the veterinarians in the state of Indiana who 
said there's really a need for veterinarians in Indiana and we ought to have a school of veterinary medicine and it ought to be at Purdue and Purdue said well we can't do that if we don't have any money and they said the legislature should vote you some money uh, and so there it is. Um, architects were disappointed that so many young people who grew up in Indiana uh, went someplace else to school because there was only Notre Dame in Indiana, no state supported school. So they came around and talked with <coughs> Emmons and me about it. And This would have been when, early 60s? Yes, early 60s. And Gene Hamilton, who worked with Fred Graham right over here in the village, uh, was the chairman of a, a scholarship committee that the Indiana Association of Architects had set up. And they said, what we'd like to do is we'd like to find out who the kids are who think they want to be architects and go someplace else. And we'd like to demonstrate the brain drain and maybe we could persuade the legislature to create a college of architecture. Uh, so Ball State people helped build a questionnaire and gave it to the architects to administer and gave them the names of the school principals to go to. And they were able over a couple year period uh, to show that indeed it was true that the people who wanted to be architects were really top flight and uh, Indiana was losing them. And once you go to Ohio or Iowa or someplace like that, you have to practice there instead of practicing, coming back and practicing in Indiana. So a commission was uh, set up to study the problem. And, and this was a state uh, The state uh, of the legislature. Uh, <coughs> And everybody assumed that it would go to IU or Purdue. So they went through the motions of visiting those schools. Uh, but about that time, well, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I don't want to hold it under a bushel either. <laughs> <than like. laughs> Play uh, away. <laughs> I, I talked to Jack about it, and I said, you know, we really ought to go after that College of Architecture. And he says, that belongs someplace else. But it didn't take him any longer than that to decide, okay, let's do it. And so we indicated our interest in the program. Well, of course, that led Indiana State to indicate its interest in the program, but we were both teachers' colleges, and nobody thought that anything would come out of that. But the committee was made up of a fellow of, of, let's see, the chairman of the committee, was, I think his name was Dan Forth from Illinois Institute of Architect up in Chicago. And a couple of people from the legislature, and they went around and visited each campus. And they found that at uh, Indiana, it was going to be in the art department. And the fellow who was head of the art department at the time uh, had been head for so long and had been at Bloomington for so long that I don't think he exerted himself very much. When they got over to Purdue, they discovered that it was going to be in the engineering department. And architects recognized that engineering is a good part of architecture, but they didn't want to be dominated, and there are plenty of colleges of architecture around the country that are dominated. When they came here, we really put together a, a team effort. Alice Nichols had uh, rigged up the gallery and we'd gotten all the architects around to bring examples of their work and we plastered the halls uh, in the gallery of architectural work to show that people in this area were interested in architecture. Uh, the College of Business came in. John Hannaford uh, talked about the contribution that social studies could make and history and all the rest. And industrial arts people did a wonderful job. Bill Middleton drawing and industrial arts drawing and all that. And then we got people in the community to meet with these visitors and have them uh, say what they would about a, what a great place Ball State was and how they would, they would help. Well, that just did it. 
uh, the committee went back uh, and were terribly impressed with, uh, I don't know what uh, happened in Terre Haute, but they were very impressed with the Ball State presentation. Now there is one other thing that's necessary to say, uh, because it doesn't usually come out. Phil Conklin was Ball State's representative to the legislature. And the way it worked out, one night about 11.30 or 12 o'clock, he's sitting in a corridor outside the meeting room of this committee. The door opens and the chairman comes out and says, Phil, you people up at Ball State really want that school of architecture? And Phil says, absolutely, you know, we gave you all that stuff. We worked on it. We, we really want it. It would make a big difference. Okay, he said, that was it. <laughs> That was it. Phil had been out having a drink at a bar somewhere. That, he might have missed the. <laughs> oh, gee. And I guess the main difficulty, Bob Linson will tell you this if you haven't yet talked to him. I haven't, I think. The, I you know, the Don Nelson, a Ball State graduate, uh, and one other person uh, got into a contest about who was going to have the the pleasure of initiating the bill and having his name on it. Yeah. And they finally had to work that out. So boy, it was a long way from now, the... Was that the architecture bill or the university bill? The way Bob Excuse remembered me. it. Excuse me, right, was it was the, the university bill. The university bill. Ah, I got that mixed up, thank but, you. But the two, the, uh, the creation of the architecture college and becoming a university were tied. In the same, in the same legislature, uh, two, two separate acts. Uh, well, it was kind of unheard of to put a school of architecture in a teacher's college, uh, and but they were prepared to do that, and uh, we were very fortunate that we had the committee that came to view it, and that there was this notion that architecture was not all art and it was not all engineering. So again. Um, what Emmons did was to go to the American Institute of Architects in Washington and say, we're going to start this new school. Now, we need two things. We need some advice about what the curriculum should be, and we need some advice about who should be the first dean. And Walter Scholler uh, was very helpful in all this. and uh, He was active in the American Institute of Architects at the time. So as a visiting committee uh, made up of five architects, one from Illinois, one from Ohio, one from North Carolina, one from Penn, I think it was, uh, came and met with us, looked at where we might have the school and talked about it and went back home again. At least one of them uh, thought it'd be nice if he'd be the dean. <laughs> um, but we chose the recommendation of uh, the dean from North Carolina, uh, whose student had been, Charles Savinfield had been his student. Now that, again, as I said in the essay, uh, that just opened up a whole new vista because uh, about this time there are a lot of people who uh, were moaning more audibly than in the past about Ball State is just a teacher's college. Mm -hmm. And now, boy, we can think we're not just a teacher's college. Uh, we've got a college of architecture. Do you think Ball State would have become a university even if the College of Architecture had gone somewhere else? I mean, that was already in the works. Yes. Uh, well, I'll say yes, but it's going to be hard to justify precisely because I don't know what day it was Emmons decided that it was going to be a university. And I don't know where that was in relationship mm -hmm. to uh, the architecture. I'm not sure. I haven't been able to mm -hmm. find that out either. I do know, uh, or at least I've heard from several people, including you in informal conversations, that uh, Dr. Emmons, for a while, was a little reluctant oh, yeah, sure. to become a university. Sure, sure. Well, James Conant had come through one time talking about teacher scholars. Uh, other people had written about uh, that quote that I have in there from Bowker. That is his name. Yeah, They're about only plumbing. 35 
Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, that one, and and the one about uh, an institution that scorns plumbing because uh, it's a menial job. Well, the the point was, it was important to do what you're doing and do it well, mm -hmm. not be complaining about it or apologizing about it all the time. Uh, the American Council on Education is the most prestigious organization in higher education in the United States. And Emmons was the first teacher's college representative to ever sit with that group. And so everybody told him that uh, Conant and other people that it was really be a mark to be the best teacher's college in the world uh, instead of being a, a small, unknown, struggling, never going to get their university. And that made a lot of sense to him, but one by one they all fell off. Uh, and so you could be the best teacher's college by being the only teacher's college. <laughs> 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 and that, that winning by default uh, didn't really add up. I did. I have noticed that Ball State of of the Mac schools and mm -hmm. uh, some of the Kentucky schools and uh, Missouri schools that were normal schools. Ball State was one of the last to become a university. Yeah, very late. Yeah. And you think this is partly uh, Dr. Emmons' reluctance to see it? Happen no question about now. it. No question about it. Absolutely true. But once once conditions were what they were, mm -hmm. he became an enthusiastic oh, supporter. Oh yes, it, it didn't take him long. I mean, uh, just like that, if he was going to support something, and he decided it was worth supporting, he did it, and uh, so he, he just worked real hard. And uh, and of course he was right when he said that we were already a university because if you counted up the faculty with PhDs, mm -hmm. uh, if you counted up the disciplines that were offered, the graduate programs that were offered. Uh, the division into four vice presidential areas, and uh, first it was three divisions, and then four divisions, and f four colleges. Um, it always right. We just had to start thinking like a university and start doing some of the things that universities do. And we had already begun some publication and some research, and it was necessary to do more of that in order to justify the decision. Uh, Dr. Burkhart, this may be a, a very appropriate place to stop. We've uh, got ourselves to a university. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Emmons would spend his last three years uh, mm -hmm. as president of the university and then retire. Mm -hmm. And then after that, more changes came, and perhaps it would be appropriate another day uh, for us to, Good. to move into that area. Good. I, I want to thank you for this. First of many interviews. Well, yes, I've, got, I've got a whole pile of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Right. Berger.